to the last session before the weekend. And uh, I would like to wrap up uh, what we have seen so far with an introduction or a discussion of the uh, trans Fourier transform for measures. So kind of this is uh, just one step beyond the ordinary Fourier transform for integrable functions. So somehow it's still in the spirit that the Fourier transform is an integral transform. So you're applying integrals, but now with more general measures. So if you would do it in the classical spirit, then you would say, can we also define a Fourier transform of a bounded measure? And in the one-dimensional case, people were using so-called Fourier tiltis integrals. Uh, and uh, if you would uh, think of a Fourier transform for a delta, then in the Fourier tiltis sense, it would be the bounded variation would be the heaviside function, which is constant one with a jump of height one at zero. And uh, so, uh, if you think in terms, I mean, Fourier tiltis integrals are very useful and are, for example, good to sum up uh, the overall work that you have to do um, in, a, in a work field, which by we mean, uh, mean the following. Assume you're biking and uh, maybe you're biking at a constant speed um, and there is uh, some wind or so. So, of course, you will have some effort to do per kilometer. But it's really the length of the, of the map and the effort that you have to do altogether is the same. Assume, however, that, you, that you're going with variable steepness. So then you would say, this flat part, maybe in the extreme case, you would say, this was nothing. It, I was just rolling. But then I have to overcome certain height. So it's a short distance, but I had to go up 100 meters. And that was a lot of effort. So suddenly, segments of, different of, of the same geometric lengths would get different weight factors. And nowadays, we would say, well, you have a measure, and the measure is, uh, is maybe an absolutely continuous measure, and its value would be a step function, which is small at the level where I'm flat area. It's, it's constant steepness. It would be a certain level depending on the steepness. And the overall integral of that function is fine. And if you rewrite it as Riemannian sums where you change the lengths, then you have the Fourier tiltis integrals. And uh, my understanding of early measure theory, and at the moment on my desk in Vienna, the uh, habilitation thesis of Radon is there, because somehow I feel uh, my teacher for analysis was an assistant to Radon, so somehow this is heritage that I should look for more closer. But I have already seen this is Harm, uh, measure theory is at the basis of functional analysis. So I think that's in the spirit of what we do all the time. We say <coughs> Banach spaces are good, Riemann integrals are nice, but they are not helping us to get complete spaces. So if we would take Riemann integrable spaces and, and then take completion, they would be abstract objects. We will get Lebesgue integration. So you do Lebesgue integration. Okay, so Riemann's tiltis integrals have to do with, with uh, uh, let's say you know the length of an interval by, or the, the importance of a piece by knowing the abstract length of a, of, a, of a thing. So you have the antiderivative or the distribution function and you take difference values. Now assume you're in two dimensions. You can say, okay, if I move a point, I can say from minus infinity up to the point, from minus infinity in the x and the y direction up to that point, this is certain area. If somebody is telling you, I know the area of all these things moving this up and down, I can compute what is the area of a rectangle. Well, unfortunately, a rectangle has already four corners. So somehow you cannot say it's the difference of this minus this, but you have a combined sum. Okay, now you do it in two, in three dimensions or so, you realize it's getting terribly complicated. And at the end, what you're doing is you're just having a way technical way of computing the volume of a box in R3, let's say. And for me, that's a good uh, motiv motivation to go into measure theory, that people were saying, well, everybody knows to determine the volume of a box. We would like to measure arbitrary sets such that they are translation invariant and so on, dilation invariant. Well, it turns out this is not possible. So we have to have the most sophisticated way of measuring the volume in a good way by looking from the inside, from the outside, and so. And then if you th start thinking in this way, and it's very natural, then you are coming into measure theory and then of integration theory and so on. 
to think about this representation theorem as something, if we think about the most general integral, and that is at the end just linearity which counts and continuity estimates by the size of the function plus continuity, then you're really coming into functional analysis. And that's why this definition is just something, I don't care how it works, I want to use it. When I was taking my driver's license, we still had to explain how the motor is working, maybe how the gears, uh, gear shift is, is, is done or so. Nowadays you say, well, you set yourself in the car, you know how to move it and what it means you want to drive. And I would say functional analysis is a little bit like this machine that tells you there are these, these tools and actually contributing to the science is of course solving problems, but I think also a little bit uh, to, to make things more simple, to provide easy kind of well-built vehicles. You sit and say, I want to drive there and the vehicle is driving it's yourself there without uh, much work. You have to pay attention, you have to control and you have to say what you want, but uh, that's all. Okay, that was kind of a very general preamble because one of the things is that you can do is why is a bounded measure compared to an unbounded measure so interesting? So first of all, what is a bounded measure? A bounded measure, you would say, is a measure where if you do it on the real line or Euclidean space, the volume of all the things, even if it's not compact, is still finite. Now, once, as long as you're doing probability, it's quite clear. You could say, if all the finite boxes have uniformly controlled volume, then you go to the limit, everything is fine. Once you're allowing positive and negative and even worse, complex valued measures, then you have to be more careful. But of course the trick is separate a measure into positive and negative part, uh, separate them into, I mean, real and imaginary part and then positive and negative part. I must say in the background, I have some ideas how to use that approach to de determine positive and negative part of a real valued measure. That's really uh, the important thing. Uh, but I have not written up these things and I think one, one has to really check it first. Uh, the idea, however, is quite clear. If I would give you a discrete real valued measure and I ask you what is the absolute value or how can you decompose it into positive and negative part, you would say it's very easy. The sum of all these deltas is absolutely convergent. If it only has positive terms and negative terms, that's what you should take. So what you only have to prove, and but that seems to be a bit non-trivial, is uh, take all these negative parts, make them finer and finer, and hope that they have a limit which you might call mu plus. Same with negative parts, and then you verify that mu plus, min, uh, plus mu minus. I mean, there are two positive parts. The difference is giving the measure, and the sum is giving the absolute value of the measure. And you have to prove that uh, mu plus as a measure plus mu minus as a measure is giving you the total variation norm. So that's something I'm quite confident. That's why I'm daring to mention it. But uh, I have not done it. So I think and at the moment I cannot, I don't need it, but I also cannot do it. And I think this is the only thing where measure theory is ahead of the approach that I have. Most of the other things I know already how to do it. So one of the natural thing is if you have a bounded measure, you are able to integrate arbitrary bounded functions, not just the continuous bound, uh, the, the constant functions, but you are also integrable, inter you can integrate everything. Now, boundedness for us means it doesn't matter how slow the function decays. Everything in C0 is controlled. It was just boundedness in the sense of a functional. And now I want to show or indicate why uh, you can extend it to the bounded continuous function, so or even functions which do not decay. Why? Because I want to apply to pure frequencies, so that, that's the point. Now, uh, in the notes I have some, some comment how one could do it, uh, with some background how to do it, and, uh, but in another slide I, I, sh I wrote a little bit different approach. So what you can say is, oh, I have to integrate a function with uh, with infinite support, maybe constant one. So how could I do it? Maybe I uh, consider the measure, that there are two ways of looking at it. Either I'm saying, if I cut it down, hopefully this will not hurt. Or I would say, somehow in a weak sense, mu is the measure of mu multiplied with the plateau function. So I choose the way of saying, 
multiplying the non-decaying function with the plateau function to make it compactly supported. And then we have to look what is the difference between uh, large and huge and very large, very huge uh, plateau function or so. So this is one way one has to show that this is the limit is meaningful and that it does not depend on the approximate unit that you choose from C0. You see already you're using C0, you're using approximate unit in C0 to get into C0 because C0 is an ideal. Anytime you multiply a bounded continuous function with a bounded function of vanishing infinity, you are getting something small. But this is one way. Uh, I would say we have already the key argument for an alternative argument, which somehow will come in any way. Measures are mostly concentrated on compact set because if I split a measure into its pieces, this sum is an absolutely convergent sum. So the formal step would be I write nu as a sum of the pieces. But we have seen we at the beginning of this lecture, if you have a bump function, you can reproduce it with a plateau function, which of course is compact support. So I can write psi as psi with psi a star, and the psi a star is moved over to the function h. And suddenly the local piece, which actually doesn't see anything else, is applied to a local function. So this is absolutely well defined. Each bounded measure is applied to a function with compact support. Now we want to control this. And of course, you can argue, does it depend on the partition of unity? And of course, this is clearly not, not the problem. So what is this action if I define it in this way? It's the action of each piece applied to the size of each piece. That's, that's what you would do. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Psi a star is what I showed you at the beginning. Uh, but it's OK to ask this question, of course. Uh, this, this one, the red guy. It's good to remember, yeah? So it's, you have a, a partition of unity and you make a plateau function, for example, by adding those elements from the partition which are overlapping with it. So psi i star is constant one on the support of psi i, therefore I can artificially enter into psi i, psi i times psi i star. And I move the psi i star over, which helps me to localize the f. That's kind of, that's the key, the trick, so that's actually that the two ideas. You have decomposed the measure into pieces, and each piece separately, you kind of use a different psi star, but it doesn't matter. Why? Because the size of each of these local pieces, since you're multiplying with a function with values in 0, 1, will be not larger than the size of this. So for all the i, this will be a constant. That's why you can pull it out. And then the remaining is the sum of the pieces, and that's, as I said, replacement for the sigma additivity, and it's coming like this. Remember, when we were proving this, this, uh, this property that the sum of these pieces is all of the things, we had these local functions fi which were glued together or so, that was kind of a, a property of C0. The supnorm is resistant. You can have as many building blocks as you want, as long as locally, each at each point, nothing sums up to anything more than one, then whatever, how many pieces you have and where they are doesn't matter. That was the key point. So I was saying, take many, arbitrary many of them, add them up, you get something phase factors, but it acts so nicely that the total measure is having the worst effect, worst possible effect. Okay, uh, now uh, I just wanted to s tell you about the target now. The target is to define the Fourier transform in a classical way. Normally you would say uh, you integrate, if you have an L1 function, you integrate that function against uh, uh, e to the minus 2 pi i s t, or if I use this as pure frequency s as a parameter, uh, understanding that if s is equal 5 and I look at the interval from 10 to 11, an interval of length 1, I will see five oscillation of the cosine term and five oscillation of the sine term. So th that's why the 2 pi is really useful in this position. Uh, and this is, the characters are with the plus, therefore when I want to integrate the e to the minus, I write chi minus s. Th that's kind of what I want to do. And this is really 
the only way or the only definition which is consistent with the Fourier transform for ordinary functions, which I will somehow consider as measures with density. So kind of if you are coming from measure theory, that would be the, the right thing. Now, uh, I have can go back now into the script, summarized a little bit of terminology, uh, which I think is uh, well placed here. So uh, if you are thinking of the world of all the Fourier transforms, then the uh, guideline is, uh, and that's what abstract harmonic analysis is telling you, that there is always the same underlying principle. You have functions on a locally compact abelian group, and the uh, most easy way to understand is the real line, because you have the group and you shift functions around. Everybody can understand that two-dimensional functions are then uh, kind of landscapes and you move those functions around. You can take the unit circle as the easiest case because, uh, easiest, let's say, uh, compact case. Continuous, continuous variable but compact. This is, you have functions on the torus and, uh, yeah, I still have my model here. So functions on the torus are these, these objects and uh, multiplication or rotation is the, trans the abstract translation or so. And uh, uh, when you have such a group, then you will, would like to study the operators. And we have seen, that's what we did in the MATLAB session, uh, that if you have a convolution operator and you use the Fourier matrix, then it's becoming a diagonalized thing. So somehow, if all the convolution operators are diagonalized, and the special case are the translation operators, we are looking for something which is, uh, which is diagonalizing the translation operator. Now, what does it mean diagonalizing? You have to have a collection of vectors in the Hilbert space, which are eigenvectors to the, to the, um, eigenvectors to the given operator. So if you are starting to uh, think your, uh, yourself do we have any eigenvector under the translation operator in the sense of that if you apply a translation to that function, so I'm starting now to think of functions on the real line, if I translate it, it should be not changing, it should be just rescaled. And I think it would be reasonable first to think, can we find bounded functions or so? And the first thing is we could say, okay, C0 functions have been quite useful, so is there a C0 function? And then you're saying, okay, you have something, and if you move it by a certain amount, it's multiplied by a certain number. So kind of, I'm thinking now the time axis in that direction, so I move in time, and I'm thinking what happens in the complex plane with this number. So if I do one time step, it's moved, it's multiplied with a complex number. So it's, the number has a radius and a, and a uh, angle. So it's, uh, maybe rotated by 30 degree and, and stretched a little bit. Well, if it's stretched, it will be stretched more and more. It will grow exponentially. It will blow up. If it's compressed, I go to the past, it will be not bounded in the past. So it must be a purely imaginary eigenvector, which is kind of clear because you're not changing the size. Therefore, this is the only candidate. So is there a function going to zero where you just rotate? And of course, again, not. If it's just rotating, it cannot go to zero. If it was some value, the value is not, the absolute value is not changed. So it must be something which has, has um, uh, absolute value one. So we have to allow continuous bounded functions. And then there, I would say there are, of course, many ways, but there's one way to say, well, if you have a function which is an eigenvector, try to prove that it has to be an exponential function. So the ones that we have seen, these are the only ones, you have a complete catalog of them. Every single S is giving you one of these functions and uh, there is no other function. Standard proof, which I don't give here, is the following, that you kind of essentially you have something like an exponential law already and you, tr or you try to prove that the function, if it's continuous, it must be actually differentiable, then you st establish the differential equation and you are uh, then getting uh, the thing. I like to use this little symbol here. Uh, maybe one can turn off the light for a moment or it's not necessary. Uh, to show you uh, how I explain that 
the, the uh, pure frequencies are a good model for eigenvectors for the translation operator. So what you see here is of course a spiral printed on, 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 the, on that uh, cylinder. So is it visible? For, I mean, it's more for the camera, but perhaps. It's okay. Yeah, okay, he can see it and then it's fine. It's, yeah, okay. So now, uh, the experiment that I would suggest, or maybe it's not good. Okay, the experiment that I suggest is the following. Uh, first of all, why is the spiral, uh, what has the spiral to do with these complex exponential functions? And as I told you, uh, I'm uh, having a function, complex valued function of, uh, of a real parameter. So the graph of that function is of course a subset of domain which is real line cross, uh, cross complex plane. So I imagine now I'm having a complex plane in front of me and my finger is putting the value of that re complex valued function at the moment t. And as I progress I move my hand so that you see what, this, what the exponential function is doing. Of course a very simple trick. I'm moving like this so in one time unit, or if S is five, it's in one-fifth of a time unit, I'm making one full circulation. So the graph is in R3, viewed as R domain cross uh, complex valued functions. Okay, now I'm getting such a spiral. What does it mean that I shift the function? Is of course I take that graph and shift it in that direction. Assume you close the eye, and I have also moved it this an infinite spiral, and I have turned it around in the appropriate way. And then you know it's the same. That's why peop some people use such spirals to transport liquid or so through, through pipelines or so, because it's moving by rotation. <laughs> okay, so in this sense we have understood that if you take, I think we can turn off this, if you take the abstract terminology that uh, the pure frequencies, that's uh, um, engineering terminology, are the characters of the group, are the mappings which behave like the exponential functions. So they map from the group into the torus group and convert the group multiplication, uh, which can actually be uh, anything, uh, into multiplication, then you have this. So if it's addition, it's what we have with the exponential function, it's really <coughs> multiplication. But you can say, how is the torus? And then of course the torus itself allows you to say, well, I can map the torus. Uh, every element x is mapped to x to the power k. So you just, then this abstract addition is rotation and you're then saying, well, I can s change the speed of rotation by, by, a by squaring it, so to say. And again, if you square too much, then you rotate by 100, uh, by 360 degree and you're back so that's why you have again the cyclic group of order n uh, has only these characters uh, of the same size so more or less you are saying verbally in the same way as for the real line the, the parameters uh, the chi s are going from uh, through, the, through the real line here you have it so in the case of the real line every such abstract character all the spirals was different distances or, or speed of rotation or so, positive and negative. They are the full collection, the full catalog of all these characters. Now, uh, we're talking about the so-called dual group. And the dual group is just coming, you can of course take two such functions, chi1 and chi2. Now the abstract group multiplication is, is, is not addition, but multiplication. But if somebody tells you he has a pure frequency with parameter s1, so e to the 2 pi s1 t, and you multiply it with the other character, which is e to the 2 pi s2 t, you would say, oh, he is taking e to the 2 pi s1 plus s2 t. So somehow, well, abstractly, we are really interested in these complex valued functions. Uh, but when we plot, let's say, the values of the free transform, we plot them as a parameter of s, of course, of the parameter. And then there, instead of multiplying the effect of two rotations, we, we are adding those numbers. So in that sense, uh, it's quite meaningful to think of the dual group, again, as an additive group. Now, we are having, uh, a, uh, in, in all these cases, 
the additive group uh, as a as uh, this dual group as something which is a subset of the bounded continuous functions. And that was, was the reason why I was looking at this. Uh, we have to see if we have uh, time next week, but the Gelfand transform would be a very nice way to say uh, the Fourier transform is the Gelfand transform, so to have another interpretation of the role of the pure frequencies. You can say L1 is a Banach space, okay. The dual space, if you have learned about it, is L-infinity, all the measurable, essentially bounded functions. If somebody says, I have a multiplicative functional, then he says that uh, all the convolution products go into pointwise products in the complex domain. So something that has to be compatible. And then you can imagine if I would say, if I convolve a Gauss function very tiny concentrated at x, with a tiny Gauss, I mean Gauss real sequence at uh, between x and y, then saying that the convolution product is is uh, working fine, it's more or less like saying the Dirac is fine, and then you get that it has to be not just an arbitrary and infinity function, but exactly character. So that's a uh, identification task. I mean, if you have the the already the knowledge that probably hopefully. Uh, they are okay, then you prove a convolution theorem that says, okay, they are point upon, they are bounded, linear, multiplicative functional. So that's just a reinterpretation of the convolution theorem. But the more, for me at least, the more difficult part would be to show that these are the only ones. In this case, you do not have other multiplicative linear functionals. Oh, yeah. Function. Well, I mean, uh, the homomorphism is, is here. So, yeah, okay. Okay, in other words, it's wrong. Uh, the, the, the spelling is wrong. It should say, not in other words, uh, with the property 100, yeah. And or, or better say, it's a homomorphism. Absolutely, yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, I usually think of it as an analog analogy to, to spaces when you are having a vector space. You're saying, I'm looking at the dual space, which is giving me information. So I'm looking at all the structure preserving mappings in this most simple object. So if you are having a real valued vector space, you are having the functionals going into the, uh, into the uh, real, of, uh, of in the field of scholars. And you're taking the linear mappings because you're interested in vector spaces. Here we're interested in groups, you're doing this. Now, there's an additional task that you would like to find out that the dual group is a locally compact abelian group, so you need a topology. And the topology that we will have implicitly many times in our story is the compact open topology. So the characters are convergent in the, in the, in the, in the compact open uh, topology. So some characters are small or they converge. If for every compact set you can tell me which epsilon you need and then we wait until uh, uh, everything is melting down to an epsilon error within the compact set. On the other hand, if you take the viewpoint that there are multiplicative linear functionals, so we're sitting inside an infinity. And then it's again, an, this is I think a nice short exercise to show that the multiplicative are a strong, a closed with respect to the strong operator topology. Because multiplicativity is something again you can point, uh, evaluate pointwise or so. And then you can say, <coughs> but if you take a bounded set of linear functionals, then they are a compact and the weak star topology. That's now for people uh, familiar with, with the right functional analysis. Yeah. So this is the big uh, observation, I would say, of, 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 uh, uh, of, of um, this compactness theorem uh, saying that uh, the arbitrary products of compact spaces are compact. Well, if you take the right topology and the, the coordinate wise topology goes over into its weak star topology. So that, that's kind of the, the, the big uh, uh, theorem. And now you have a closed subset of a compact subset. Therefore, the set of all multiplicative linear functionals must be closed. That must be, must be compact in the, in the weak star topology. So you have to verify that if you restrict the weak star, that might be a reasonable good exercise. 
to see that the uniform convergence over compact sets on the characters is the same as the weak star topology as a subset of L infinity. One direction is easy. If something is convergent uniformly, it's weak star convergent. So if you apply to L1 functions, it's, it's OK. The converse is something you have to look for a little bit. But then uh, the question is, uh, there is one bad functional that you would not like to do, and that's the zero functional. It's also multiplicative. So if you throw away the zero functional, then you have a locally compact space. And that's why the dual group, uh, that's one way to recognize <coughs> why the dual group in every of these situations is locally compact. Uh, in the real line, you can say, well, we have taken zero away, and, and that's kind of, we have taken away infinity. Otherwise, it would be compact or so. So what is going on with the characters? Well, what happens if you let the characters go to infinity? The oscillation goes with large and larger. Somebody says a smooth test function, or a, even just a test function. What is happening if you integrate it? OK, we are actually looking at the Fourier transform at a high frequency, higher and higher frequency. Riemann Lebesgue, the proof has been done, is going to zero. So yes, uh, the infinity in the terms of the frequency is the zero functional. And because we have taken it away, it's locally compact. But we are happy because for every locally compact abelian group, we have a, a, a locally compact abelian dual group. Now, as usual, if you have a construction, you can repeat it. You can say, now we have a bidual and tree dual and so on. And there is, like Han Banach, a natural embedding of the group into a bidual group. And that turns out to be all the time uh, an identity. So there's a natural identification of uh, the <coughs> dual group of the dual group. And, uh, and that's the so-called Pontryagin duality theorem. Uh, something that I will not do here because I'm mostly interested in the continuous uh, non-compact case, so in the Euclidean case. Uh, in the general setting, you would have, of course, if you have the classical theory of Fourier series, you would say it's continuous but compact. Therefore, the Fourier transform side, I mean the dual group, is the integers. It's discrete, so compactness, compactness goes to discrete and, uh, and uh, continue, well, continuity goes to infinity. So, it's, so only if it's discrete in mean finite, it's finite and discrete, then it's discrete and, uh, and, and, and pun, discrete and compact. So discrete and compact goes in compact plus discrete, which in both cases means finite. And then, of course, the, in, uh, the number of elements of the dual group is the same as the dual group and so on. And there's a nice splitting. Maybe at some point we talk about two-dimensional things. Uh, certainly later on we should do it. So when you're asking me, how can I understand Fourier analysis of two variables, then one good way is to say, well, R2 is the direct product of x-axis with y-axis. So if you have a function which is a pure frequency of one variable and another function of two variables, you get an exponential function of two variables with a vector of two, uh, with two parameters. So we would say the dual group of Rn is just Rn. And what you write is the e to the 2 pi and the st is just becoming a scalar product. So it's again using the, the, the exponential law. Uh, people in image analysis would say the pure frequencies are now the plane waves, so the cosine. And if you think of plane waves, I mean, look at the ocean or so, you would say now the waves are fairly big, uh, but rather wide, or at some other moment they are small. They have changed direction, so that's exactly the parameters that you need to describe the plane waves by their orthonormal vector. So high frequency means far away from zero, meaning a high oscillation in some direction. And orientation and, per and size gives us this. OK, so just back to, to what we really want to do. The Fourier transform has to be uh, taken in this. And we have either the concrete exponential law or the abstract thing. And my friends from the engineering community always wanted to write characters with e to the i because in all the cases where it's, where it's practical or easy, so-called elementary groups of the form Rn cross set k cross torus, it's clear that they will be exponential functions. But um, you don't have to know what this is if you're interested in periodic analysis or so maybe you write it in an abstract way. Okay, uh, 
Now here is the definition. The Fourier transform can be defined by applying the, the measure to a bounded continuous function in that way. And uh, you could also say that's the conjugate of this. And uh, something that is only possible in, in the real line is the dilation operator. So if I think I'm just stretching or compressing without changing the values, these characters, I will get characters at different place. And uh, then uh, I have a, th a theorem that, uh, yeah, this is, I don't want to go through the details now, it's a bit too late. Uh, that is one of the typical statements where I, I, mean, I like to play around with, with these little epsilon and little errors here and there, and I write things in this way. So maybe I just try to explain to you what kind of things, results we need. Uh, I'm reading, assume that we have a, n a tight net, and as I told you, from, for us, for these applications, are always bounded and tight nets, or just bounded nets are needed, which are weak star convergent to mu zero. Again, what does it mean if I have a test function which is convergent, uh, which is living on the compact set, so I'm watching these measures only on the compact set. On the other hand, I'm telling you, but the family is tight. That means everything outside should be no, play no role. And then I'm saying, if you have now a family, and I'm actually thinking of pure frequencies which are convergent to a limiting frequency, but it's a prototype of a family which is not uniformly convergent. Assume you have two very nearby frequencies. So I'm oscillating with frequency 5 and 5 plus epsilon. So they start to oscillate very much, but at some point they are completely apart. This moment was actually the proof where you showed that Riemann-Lebesgue lemma, that you say, I find something where the difference is having e to the minus pi and there was big, and therefore the, the amplitude must be small. That was something like this. So even if the difference is very small, uh, there will be an oscillation, uh, but it doesn't matter because on a big interval where most of the things happen, is things are okay. So if you just look at, at very quickly at, uh, at the proof, with, uh, it would be boring to go through the details. What you see here is that you're multiplying uh, those measures with plateau functions. And for some reason that will would become clear when you go through the details of the proof, I even write the square of a plateau function. But you will think, okay, within the plateau it's one anyway. And if you say I take the square of a plateau function, it's going down somehow. The shape outside is not important or so. So I'm saying, going into the whole story by saying, if, if a family is, is tight, then I can even find the square of a plateau function such that multiplying the, all these measures with this squared plateau function, everything is small, and I do it such that at the end an epsilon comes out. Now, uh, this plateau function helps me to reduce everything to a compact set. So I, I have to note how big is my plateau function, where is the plateau function living. And if in, in the whole domain that is under consideration after restricting to the plateau area is fine, then I will be happy. And then of course I'm using the convergence. So these functions age better. You can think of pure frequencies are convergent to a limiting frequency. They are, can be made small, well, only on the compact set, but for all the elements in the compact set for make, by making the index smaller. And then, of course, and that's where, where I stop going through the details, I have to say, well, if I take the measure, that's what I really am interested some measure with a high enough number, so I'm close to the limit, and then I'm taking a frequency which is close to the limiting frequency, but actually I would be interested to have the limiting measure and the limiting function. Then I have a lot of errors, and you see I'm adding terms, I'm changing from the measure to p times the measure, from p times the measure with h beta to, to h zero and so on, and so you add terms and you control all the terms in the right order, and the end is uh, some constant times epsilon, and this was a given constant, so you can achieve this. So uh, just to give you an idea is uh, 
if you think of these measures, now you had a lot of measures, but they were all equally concentrated. You can think of all the discretized versions of these measures. So somehow I'm trying to say, well, if you take a discrete measure, especially if you take a Dirac delta, and you take its Fourier transform, yeah, maybe we should do this. So if, um, yeah, let's try to do it on the fly. So I would say the head of delta x at the frequency s is delta x at chi of uh, minus s. Huh? <coughs> is it correct? Yeah. Now, what is a character at minus s? This is e to the minus 2 pi i, so that's e to the uh, minus 2 pi i s x. Yeah, OK, so we're done. 2 pi i s. Ah, yeah, this extra, this extra. Thank you. Thank you. It will compile better in this way. Pardon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's hope that it works quickly. Yeah. Okay. So I'm zooming in. So this is a one line proof. What is the free transform of a direct measure? And the one, uh, this is apply the Dirac measure to the character, which is e to the 2 pi s. This is a function of s. So you can, of course, r write, I didn't uh, want to do it, as character. So uh, character, but now with the x as the frequency. So a pure delta goes into a character with a negative parameter, chi of minus x. And later on, we cannot do the chi of s. Here, we would like to have a symmetric version that pure characters go to delta. The musician listening to a piece of music and saying, I hear only a sinusoidal tone that's exactly this frequency and this loudness. So that would be the opposite, which is not possible because still we are in an asymmetric situation. We're having functions, um, uh, bounded measures, that's far beyond L1, but we are producing Fourier transforms, which we will see in a moment are not bounded measures, not at all. But for uh, this is a good example. So. Every discrete measure, this is what we can also say now, every discrete measure is an absolutely convergent sum of Dirac's. So it will be on the Fourier transform side an absolutely convergent sum with the amplitudes times these characters. Now each of these characters is a bounded continuous function of norm 1. It has absolute value 1. So if you tell me I have sum of such characters, I think it's easy to check that the sum of the coefficients is exact is a possible estimate for the norm. So every discrete measure has uh, gives you a bounded, actually uniformly continuous function. So we have the nice situation already that this simple definition of the Fourier transform, once you restrict it to the bounded measures, uh, is giving you uniformly continuous functions. Actually, I must say I have used something now which is in the script already earlier. I don't want to scroll back, but this is the fact that if somebody is giving you a discrete measure, and you could say, well, a discrete measure is in the closure of the finite discrete measures, then it's nothing else but an absolutely convergent sum. So there's a trick to say, if somebody says it's in the closure, you would say, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe the deltas are getting more and more dense. I mean, isn't somehow the Riemann integral over interval A1, a limit of discrete measures. That's the big difference between strong operator topology and a norm topology. If you take action on a given element, so we're talking about strong operator topology, yes, these continuous measures are limits. If you stay with the norm measure, then uh, you can only say everything which can be approximated in the norm can be also written as an absolutely convergent series. 
you kind of write it as a telescopic sum. So you re rewrite the differences. You have a very quickly approximating uh, sequence. You rewrite it by the differences. You turn it into absolutely convergent sum. But an absolutely convergent sum is just a sum coefficients in the sequence space L1 times deltas. So I um, have used this fact that the discrete measures, they are nice, closed subspace, and their full transform is easy to s find out that they are continuous. And now what we would like to know is, is this true for arbitrary measures? And you have seen, okay, we can approximate the discrete measures by the discrete, uh, by the bande. We can approximate arbitrary measures mu by the discretized versions. So, okay, which we are, it's very easy. We approximate uh, the Fourier transform of mu hat, which we are interested, we can write now already, by the Fourier transform of the discrete measures. And that's where I need this strange lemma with the many epsilon or so. I have this family of discretized measures which are going to the limit, and I want to look at this at the Fourier transform side, and at the same time I would like to have the continuity or so, and that's where I get this. So I think I don't want to go too much into this, but uh, you see here what, what the consequence of this abstract machinery is, that whatever psi I have, and whatever close by points I have, so I'm having points in the frequency domain which are close enough, uh, the distances can be always controlled, thanks to this lemma. And it's due to the fact that essentially everything is happening on a compact set and the frequencies are converging on that set where things is interesting. So th this means if you go to the limit first with respect to psi, if this is true for every psi, can go to the limit, it will be pointwise convergent, of course, because th that's another thing. And then you find out that mu hat will be a, a uniformly continuous function. But it's also interesting to say that all these approximating functions are equally good in terms of quality, so they're equicontinuous family. So we have now a nice statement about the riemann stiltjes transform. The Fourier transform is a linear non-expansive mapping uh, from the space of bounded measures with the measure norm into the uniformly bounded continuous function with the sup norm. And of course you can control the maximum of the Fourier stiltjes transform because all these characters have norm one by the norm of the function. Uh, but you can also have ask, is, is this an equivalent norm or so, or can you control it from below? Answer is no. It's not so difficult to show that highly oscillatory measures can have Fourier transform which are small everywhere. Also, they have norm one in the measure sense. So kind of, the, that's, a, that's a big difference. Yeah, uh, here maybe you have some more details. Uh, what we ha that's a standard way of thinking now of mine. Uh, whenever I can show things for these discretized measures for a given measure, I think it's probably also true to prove it for just tight and weak star conversion nets, whatever they are. Actually, you could say, and that will be useful later, you could say, I have a measure and it's very rough measure. So I would like to convolve it so you smooth it out, or you take just an arbitrary L1 function and you would approximate it by convolved versions. Of course, then you would say it's already convergent in the norm of, of L1, but you, if you take a measure and you smooth it out, these smoothed versions do not converge in norm if the measure is not in L1, but still they go to in the weak SAR stance. If you're doing a little bit of smearing, are you destroying tightness? No, you're not destroying. So that would be a situation. Take a measure, smooth it out, and you will have exactly the situation. That's why I like this. Yeah, um, now maybe the final thing, because I see it's getting close to four o'clock. Uh, uh, something that I will not do now, and actually I will postpone or even leave out for the discussion. You will be interested to know if the Fourier stiltjes transform is still uh, injective. Uh, and even if it's injective, then another way would be to try to come back. I think it's more important that we spend mo more time next week to make the whole situation even more general and more symmetric, so th that f time and frequency are getting symmetric. But I like, would like to give you an indication of how one would do it. So what was the basis for the for the, I mean, the, I think the, the kind of 
ideological background, so to say. How you should look at this to get uh, a hand on the problem, I think is more important to, to, to describe. So how did you prove the inversion theorem and also actually the Planchet theorem? You were using what Hans Reiter called the fundamental relation and I think you called it the multiplication theorem. So it's this theorem that f integrated against g hat is the same as g against f hat. So uh, this was a consequence of Fubini applied to the function f of t g of s uh, as a function of two variables integrated against the exponential kernel. Now we would like to do something like this in the same way now we have seen mu hat is a bounded continuous function. Every bounded measure can be used to integrate such a bounded continuous function and we are kind of pairing them. Either the mu hat or the nu hat and there's always a measure on the other side and they're going in opposite directions. So maybe we can do it and that's really the generalization to the measure situation. We can do this. I think if you would start from the from the from that relationship, it was verified with measure theory, you could try to take limits by smoothing these measures out and getting into L1 and you would probably be able to, to reach this result. Now of course that would already use measure theory so I have to try to use a different method. What could be a good method? Try to understand what happens with the Dirac's. So uh, I have it somewhere down. Or where is it? I thought I have it here. Uh. Yeah, maybe it's not worthwhile to play around. At least I continue talking while browsing. So you should try to do this on the... On yeah, here it is. This is really the formula that I would like to emphasize. You try to verify it on deltas. So somebody is giving you two deltas, one on the time side, one on the frequency side. And then you would like to know, is it true that delta y applied to the Fourier transform of delta x is the same as delta x applied to the Fourier transform of delta y? And then you read it out. What is the Fourier transform of the delta x Fourier transform? It's a character at position y. So you say, oh, it's the pure frequency x at position y. And the right hand guy says, no, no, it's the pure frequency y at position x. But that's the same. <laughs> okay, so this is really a, a reinterpret, uh, this symmetry of the exponential law in terms of time and frequency, which is really good and helps us to make also the rest of the story symmetric. And so uh, I think I it's enough if I indicate if you have this, then you can prove it for finite linear combination of delta x, then for finite linear combination of delta y. What you really have to do is, and, but then the program is clear. I mean, that's kind of, I could say, then the rest is homework and probably you would spend some time, but it's not that you would not know what you have to look for. You would just have to say, oh, no, that epsilon is too big. What ha do I have to choose first so that I can go to the limit? How do these converge? And, but we know already they converge in a nice way. And that's, we know that these measures, so to have it in the continuous setting, mu hat and this relationship. The mu hat is living essentially in a compact set. So I can pretend in the first approach it's living in a compact set. So instead of the new hat, I think I take the Fourier transform of the deep psi of mu hat. But they are nice and for them this is a valid or so. So essentially you would say we have to go from deep psi mu with d, I don't know, another psi uh, new, where the formula is definitely valid as a sum of trivial f uh, facts to the limit and then we have this. And then again we have to choose uh, appropriate, we have to see there enough Fourier transforms so that you get the uniqueness and the next step would be to try to come back. But we have a situation uh, realistically within this framework without uh, doing sigma algebras or Lebesgue integration where you can show we have now an algebra homomorphism from the measures with convolution into the bounded uniformly continuous functions. And uh, I think I will uh, leave this uh, discussion about Banach modules as a starting point for our next session because we have seen many of these Banach modules now. And uh, 
just to, to give you an idea about the outline of, of, of the next part of the program, we are now in a situation where test functions, C0 functions, and bounded measures and the Fourier transform, they're kind of all mixed around. So uh, the next step will be to narrow down the space of test functions. So, so to say, to have functions which are both bounded measures and, and test functions. So that will be a space inside C0 of integrable Riemann integrable continuous functions, my Wien algebra. Then you have a dual space. Then you have already a layer which is rational, real, imaginary part. This is good for certain things. So this is already giving you the spirit of distribution theory. Whatever we do with functions, we can do with more general functions, we can approximate it in the weak star sense to the outer limit. But when we do Fourier transform, again, these function spaces are not Fourier invariant. And by the pictures you have seen, you know already they don't look nicely rotation invariant or so. So we have to try to find something <coughs> even better, but not much more complicated. I hope that I can t uh, convince you that it's not much more complicated, but with some extra work. And then we can do time frequency analysis, and suddenly we will see what Gabor essentially told us, that time frequency should be looked at equal footing, and you should also not only look at time, oscillating function, or frequency telling you, well, these frequencies are important, but you don't know where, but you should look at time frequency. So these two ideas, what is it about time frequency analysis, meaning mathematical theory of spectrograms, operators understood through the spectrograms, and how can we embed this into distribution theory? And as you have seen from the picture, the space of test functions will be around the Schwartz space, so it will be somewhat bigger, but still inside all of the LP spaces the dual space will contain the LP spaces. Therefore, within that context, we can go for a full transform of LP spaces for any P that will not be a problem. We are not restricted to hausdorff young conditions and such things. Okay, I think it's a good point to stop here and go into the weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>